<laughs> Tell me about your involvement with uh, Exotic Pop before we even get too into this, because we are probably the biggest distributor, or the biggest sales of a, uh, or the sales point for Exotic Pop in California. But I guess you guys are repping that hard out there too. Yeah, I'm their brand ambassador. Fire. Yeah, so I get paid great money, and um, to represent, to make sure everybody know about it. How long have you been doing that? It's been about officially three three months. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's what's up. Yeah, I had no idea that a lot of the, the Houston legends are uh, wrapped up with Exotic Pop when we started selling it. And then fucking I saw Paul Wall repost me with the, the case out there, and I'm like, oh, shit. And you walked in with it. I'm like, oh, it's really going down. Yeah, I got a whole – my whole backseat is filled up with these and – Canada Dry Vanilla Creams and uh, like my favorites. Mm. You got yeah. Moon Rocks in that blunt? Yeah. It smells like it. And I can see a with lot. the dark ass. Oh, yeah, yeah. That thing is burning. Yeah. I'm having the time of my life. <laughs> <laughs> is the Moon Rocks for you kind of a, a, a California thing? Or are you smoking those when you're back home too? It depends on the mood. Mm. You know, I'm more of a flower guy, but little wax here and mm. there but I, I i don't do the dabs like it's too strong i don't want to be that you know what i mean that's futuristic shit yeah that's like the I'm, jetsons i'll put some wax in the blunt and on you know outside but yeah right well, yeah, that's, occasionally that's futuristic level shit whenever i see people taking dabs i just you're getting too high i don't yeah. need to be that high me neither i'm high enough off the the backwood no problem right <laughs> and, and that's cool <laughs> definitely and so uh okay let's let's just like go all the way back to your your early days so you were actually born in uh in houston correct okay so you're you're a lifelong ambassador and you still live within the city limits i am still in uh, harris county you never see yourself leaving uh i'm always on the road so i'm always gone mm. most of the time so i live on the road i live home Half, it's half and half. Right. Yeah. What was uh? Tell us a little bit about your upbringing and just what it was like for you as as a young boy before you even got in the rap game or anything. Well, in my family, everybody do music. So my grandma, she the choir director. She played the piano. Mm -hmm. So if you born in my family, you go be in the choir. Mm -hmm. You go sing. You go do something. So I played the drums, piano, and um, doing the talent shows and. You know, battle rapping, and mm. then you know one of my family members sings with In Vogue, really. And you know, so I've always been like around studios in the studios, you know, playing the piano. So right, sports, music. Those are the two primary focal points. Correct, definitely. Um, so was the battle rap thing a real serious thing for you? Because when they try to like summarize your career, they're like, oh, at first he was a battle rap legend. Like, how how far did you actually go with that? How'd you get into that? Like, when you freestyle, you know what I mean? Like, down where I'm from, you know, down south, we battle off the top of the head. Mm. You know what I mean? We don't memorize the line, so. These days, shit is crazy if you watch yeah, Battle Raps. I fuck with it. Like, yeah. I love it. I'm going to one of the battles in Houston in a few days on June 8th. Um, you know, I fuck with Hollow to Dunn. I fuck with Disaster. Mm -hmm. That's my guy. Disaster guy. I had in here, man. That is That's a, my guy, insane guy. character. He is so uh, funny. Yeah. Yeah, disaster, holler the done, murder moot, mm. loaded lux, uh, zip them up, man. Hey, it, I love it. But at that time, your mentality towards battling was more just showing up and just shitting on somebody off the right. top of your head. Yeah. It wasn't like now where there's these calculated game plans mm -hmm. of just they, there's so much thought that goes into it, and everybody wants to hit on all the different styles of battling. I'm I'm good. Morning moon rock. I don't know. Straight up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So so with the battle, like, it, we freestyle off the top of the head, like, you know, what you got on, your, <laughs> your appearance, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, it wasn't, like, premeditated. Mm. Yeah. I remember probably, like, the gnarliest thing I ever seen in a battle online was I seen a girl pull out a picture of the other girl that she was battling's bed. And she had this super bummy-ass bed. And you could just tell that it hurt her feelings real bad when it came out because you're just looking at this bed like, holy fuck, that really is. <laughs> That's a flagrant thing to pull out here right now. You ever been over somebody's house and they just got a disgusting room? Yeah. <laughs> you kind of walk right in and walk right out like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It says a lot if you live like that. It does. Myself, I had a girlfriend for like three years, so now I'm like completely embedded with the cleanliness aspect, which right. I never really was before, to be honest. My, my bed was always on the floor for a long ass time. 
Hey, it don't matter. <laughs> it, it don't matter where the motherfucker start at. It's where you end at. Yeah, that's a fact. And if you end up on the floor, hey, it's because you want to be there. Yeah. Sometimes I do some of the shit, you know, that I started off doing um, at the beginning of my career. You know what I mean? So going to places, you know, where I used to record at and, you know, sometimes you just want to capture that feeling. Mm. You, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I get it. Put the bed back on the ground? Fuck it. <laughs> I never really even understood what the bed was doing there. Like, with the <laughs> having the whole bed and shit, it just never really made sense to me. It was like, why do I need a big wooden structure to put this shit on when it could just go on the ground? I, you only need what you think you need. Mm. How deep do you get into the, the battle thing before you sort of transition um, into being more of a, a established rapper? I probably had... Good 200, something like that, battles, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it was heavy. Like, we would meet up, everybody put, you know, money up, you know. You probably had this one guy, and he got, like, five of his, you know, his people. And we, yeah, my guy, you know, cold, and we got five people. Okay, well, all y'all put up 200, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And put up the 200, you know what I mean? Put the pot up, all right, we battling it for this, you know what I mean? So... The people who put the money up, like, you know, we win, mm. you know, so the people who put the money up, they get their money back and then I get the other money. It sounds like it would just be so difficult to come to any kind of conclusion about who won and, like, actually handing over the money. Did that shit get complicated quite often? Uh, a couple of times it did, a couple of times, but, like, I, my mind is so quick. Like, I, like you, you know how you fuck somebody up so bad till they know they got fucked up? Yeah. And you you just, you they, they, they life just... You know, soul just goes out of their body. Right. Yeah. With well, the battle shit now, they don't even announce who the winner is. Yeah, I don't like that. It's so strange. I don't like that. And, and, and another thing I don't like, I don't like the fact how sometimes it's popular, like meaning like the popularity, like if one of the people have more people in the crowd, oh, you know, yeah. and, if they're, and if they're louder, you know, they could just sit there and boo your bars. You probably mm -hmm. spend the dopest shit, but because you don't have more people. Mm -hmm. So I think I think it needs to be judged half and half like half of what the crowd thinks and kind of like half of what some judges think right because i've seen i've seen it where dudes will show up with a fucking army of 20 dudes with them and right. the dudes are all hooting and hollering like yeah. booing and really like trying to skew the results mm -hmm. and make it seem like one person is getting booed like one person is doing horrible but really they're they're just surrounded by so many people that they're kind of trying to drown out the actual results yeah i agree yeah. When did you did you make like a conscious decision at a certain point to be like I'm gonna I'm gonna leave all that shit behind and I'm gonna get more into this like real rap thing or did, did it just sort of slowly happen to you? I'm just a person. I do it all. Mm. Um, Spears it, it led me to meeting DJ Screw and you know C Note and the Botany Boys. Um, it wasn't a, a choice. Like I'm gonna just stop you know doing basketball. Like the money started coming. The the fame, um, the way people treated me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just to go from, like, I always got into clubs, like, I've never paid to get in the club ever in my life, because I always you, you were one of those young dudes who was just super tapped in and had all these connections early on. Right, so I was in the club when I was a kid. Yeah. People so, like me, you're the type of person that made somebody like me when I was a young person feel kind of insecure, because I was looking at, like, listening to the radio and watching videos and just being like, how the fuck are all these dudes so cool? They're like the same age as me. I ain't got shit going on. I understand, man. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for doing that to you. It's all right. But, but guess what? You Now you're cool. Eh, just barely. Nah, you, you cool, you know? We're both cool because we got exotic a, pop. True. It's a heavy show, though, you know? I, I, I know. That. I know about the show. Mm. And, um, you know, all the people that, you know, fuck with y'all and support, man, so... I hear everything. That's one thing about me from the new artists, the new shows, the new podcasts. Like, I stay in tune with everything that's going on. Yeah. And, um, yeah, y'all hear me. Because nobody ever really falls off until they really stop paying attention to the culture. That's my opinion is that, like, you know, when, when somebody just becomes too cool to really give a fuck about what's going on in rap, I think that's when it starts to slow down. But you always hear that about even the legends who are the most ducked off, the people you never hear from. You always end up hearing that they, those are dudes who are really paying close attention to the culture and what's going on. Yeah, it, it's some people that don't. They got tunnel vision. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then, you know, it's us. You know, we pay attention. You got to you gotta know what your competition doing. Mm. You got to know what you, you know, competing up against. 
was was screw the first person that you met of any like real significance who wanted to work with you or whatever or was that at what point did you meet him and how did that change things well i hung with all the ogs and the screwed up clicks so you know um meeting screw it opened like it opened me up to a whole different fan base on the mixtape market you know what i mean um then at the time i was messing with south park mexican too mm. right so you know my Mexican fan base and Hispanic fan base is crazy. You know what I mean? So all that combined with the battle rap shit as with, well. With you had that. a hell of fan bases coming together. Right. And then sports. And then um, my family, they, you know, ride horses and rodeo. So we would promote our music there too, like during the trail rides. Right. So oh, shit. I just had like all these different elements going. You know, I'm hooping, playing basketball, baseball, football, I boxed. Uh, I'm a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. Really? I do jujitsu, all that, you know, all that shit. So wow. like, like with all that going on, like I, I just, I've been trained and conditioned to be a leader in baseball, football, all these different sports. Right. So, hey, I'm the same way in life. Wow, that's crazy. I didn't know you had a martial arts background. Mm -hmm. They gotta get you on Joe Rogan. Hey, you never know. <laughs> Services available. But I, I do. I manage like boxers and MMA fighters, and you mm -hmm. know, what I mean, shout out to Tony Wynn, man, my homie. You know, he got commercials with Chuck Norris and. You know, shit like that, man. And oh, shout shit. out to FA, man, the plug, hooking this up for me, man. You know, believe that. Oh, for real? Yeah, okay. That makes sense then. Um, okay, but so tell me about the first time that you actually met Screw. Screw. Because he was okay. super enthusiastic okay. about you from super early on, correct? Correct, correct. I, I met him multiple times. We had this little place called Cornbreads in Houston where all the vampires, you know, the people that's up, you know, late night. You know, me included. Um, we would be out. We'd go shoot pool, whatever. You know, hang out, parking lot, smoke, drink, whatever. Congregate. Right. And um, he would see me a few times, and everybody tell him about me. So, you know, told him about me. Like, he, So he's like, man, I want you to freestyle for me. Um, it was this club called Club Unique. He wanted me to freestyle, so I did two of them for him. And I was just rapping about, you know, what I was watching and what he had on. And next thing I know, he invited me over two screw tapes. I actually have three tapes, but one of them, somebody who rapped on it, they didn't like their parts, so we never put it out, but I went the fuck off on that tape, and I was that tape when it came out, because I was, man, yeah, so it's all good, but yeah, so he noticed me, put me on those tapes, and uh, I started doing freestyles, people paying me to freestyle at their clubs, so I'm, I'm leaving. I left a show, did my high school graduation, walked across the, you know, stage, class of 99 worthy, Green and go, yeah. And so I, I walked, did that boom, and then went to another show. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So, you know, I'm everywhere. So you are already up in there. Yeah. Do you always just have like an insane level of energy? Because when you're describing all these different pastimes you had, it just seems like wow, like that's that sounds like the lives of like ten different people combined. Yeah, I've lived many lives. <laughs> I'm, right now, I'm on the bonus level. Right. Because you, know? you already kind of accomplished what you really were trying to do with your life years to ago. A gold album. Mm. I just wanted one. Okay. That's it. And once you get that thing you're going for, it can be kind of a weird moment in your life because then you're like, well, now I got to figure out some new goals. Yeah. And then, so it went to from that to platinum, obviously. Then, you know, wanted to sell 10 million and 3 million triple, you know, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. And other goals was like Oscars and um, Grammys and, you know what I mean? Right. A mixture of those things and a few other things, but now my final goal is to get a billion. A billion dollars? Yeah. Really? Because yeah. Jay Z just uh, made history. Yeah. Congrats to Jay Z. Yeah. That's what he's supposed to do. That's wild. You know what I mean? That's what he's supposed to do. Yeah, and he's not even like Dr. Dre being the first billionaire would be logically kind of make more sense since he owns the whole Beats by Dre thing and shit. But we we underestimate Sean Carter having a whole lot of business going on behind the scenes as well. Well, a lot of people did. I'm glad I wasn't one of those people. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from Jay Z. Like really? people like Jay Prince, uh, Jay Z, Master P, Tony Draper, um, Cash Money's Diddy's, like all those people, you know, even the people that, you know, ran Duck Down Records. Right. And, and, and you know, I'm a piece of all those people. You I occur, study. Yeah, you occurred to you seem like you're the type of person who was very much studying the game. So you kinda had a whole lot of uh of game sort of embedded in you when even when you were real young. Correct. You've been paying attention. 
I got to, man. You know, majority of the people I hung with was older. Like, I wasn't into, like, going, you know, skating and, like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, at the age where you want to, everybody's, let's go to the skating rink. Like, I'm, I'm in a studio. Mm, I learned how to engineer. Yeah. I'm getting paid, you know, $50 an hour recording legends. What what was your thought process on Screw before you actually got in with him? Like, did you were you was he established enough, and did you understand how legendary he was? Oh yeah, he was like a god to us mm. in real life. It was epic. Was there a, like a growing up, of a level of growing up that took place in a sense? Because there's all these insane stories about him and the drugs and just the long studio sessions and everything. You being so young. Was that something that was a little bit new to you, or were you already experienced enough that this didn't take you by surprise? Nah, it, it, nothing, nothing was new to me. I was exposed to everything mm-hmm. um, young, and people explained to me what it was. You know how some people, some parents try to hide things from you, and like, you know, so it's a way you got to, you know, try to reach out to your kids and explain to them, you mm-hmm. know, this is what it is, blah, 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 blah. Because you'd rather them learn from you than somebody out, out outside the household teach them. You know what I mean? Right. So, yeah, this is what I was, you know, born into. Right. When you were hanging out with Screw, when you were doing that first tape, were you drinking lean? Were you, were you partying to the extent that he was? Nah, I didn't I didn't go as hard as he went. Like, okay. like, like he had, at that time, he had, like, his money was, like, like you know what I mean? Selling tapes yeah. out the house, right? Just a couple I, dollars I, at a time. He could afford to, you know, pull a four and a twenty ounce. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah, nah, we wasn't going that hard. But I mean, he would pull you a cup here and there. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Let you hit his cup. Hey, hit this. You know what I mean? Did you like it as much as he seemed to like it? Mm, back then, no, no, not, not like when I first met him. No, I did, I didn't. But then I grew to. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So after, so how did you get your first record deal after that, that screw thing? Like how far apart were those, those incidents? Well, that's the thing I put out, like I put out albums on my own first, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Then I met up with my old business partner, Hump, and then we got, he had Sucker Free Entertainment. And okay. when we met, I'm like, hey man, let's turn it to a record label. So that's when it turned to Sucker Free Records. Okay, so you were putting out a bunch of stuff independently and just Correct. hustling the, out of the trunk, that type of thing? Yeah, because I met Hump, like, I met him, like, middle school, but I really didn't do any business with him until, like, high school, like, five years later. You right. know what I mean? But so was he, or so, okay, you do all that, and then you start to get labels' attention? Correct. Yeah, once I do that, I'm on mixtapes, I'm freestyling. Um, I'm going to 97.9 The Box. I'm going hard, freestyling, you know, just everywhere. Did you, you know? see yourself becoming like a major national star or were you still sort of in the mind state of just doing your thing on a, on a more local Texas level? Because you can, you can fully stay in that environment mm-hmm. and be a star on that level. And especially at that time, people weren't necessarily looking at stuff from down south as stuff that could blow up on a huge level, right? Correct. I, I didn't look at myself like anything, but I, I did look at myself in a way to be like, I know what I didn't want to be. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't know exactly what I was going to be, but I knew I didn't want to be local. Mm-hmm. I knew I didn't want to make the exact same mistakes other people did. I knew I didn't want to rap like everybody else. You know what I mean? I knew I wanted to still embody the Texas culture within my music, but still, you know, show that we got people that are lyrical, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Because, like, where I'm from and down south, you know, they the quote and the stigma is that, you know, down south artists aren't lyricists and we can't spit. So I make sure every time I drop a project, I balance, you know, with my culture, the screwheads, uh, the people that want to hear bars, and mm-hmm. then the ladies, and then whatever the hell I want to make, my creative EDM, you know, DJ Marshmallow, DJ Snake. That's where DJ your mind Seth. is at? Yeah, I, I do EDM. Right. Yeah, I was touring with uh, Marshmallow and uh, I fuck with, you know, Clint Sparks. And, but know. that's interesting to hear you say that, like that is like the main thing that your creativity tends to go towards. 
mine yeah the edm type stuff is that like really like that's sort oh, of yeah. your passion at this moment or where you think that progression has taken place it, it's it's a, i do them all like i've been doing edm like i got an artist that i partnered up with his name's critchy critch he's out here now okay. in la uh, and he like i knew about like house music techno and you know edm but like he he made me look at music a different way like everybody i meet like let's let, let's say for instance me doing music with David Banner, like we from Texas, we laid back, you know. Me doing business and music and tours with David Banner and his energy, it showed me a different angle for me to be a performer, right? Mm. So, you know, I, I, I've witnessed but Buster Rhymes and uh, DMXs, these great performers, you know, performing. So it just put me in a different mind frame, man. And, um, in terms of like what a live performance could be because sometimes i mean let's just be real sometimes rap just doesn't really translate as well to the live experience like we've all seen great rappers who realistically weren't really putting on that great a show and maybe the show is still dope because the audience is so into it right but without the audience they're barely moving and they're not really getting into it and there's not really a whole lot going on correct yeah yeah that happens all the time were you sort of out to do you feel like you you were kind of trying to disprove that assumption about the South, that y'all weren't, like, serious rappers? Correct. 